usually. So then it says the way it's all here and wants to put the and when you get this, you get like these things right where to enter it. And then uh, if you get stuck, it'll offer your help. For example. And it'll also, if you have data, it'll transfer it to stack crunch. And that's what you need to do to solve the a lot of the mathematics. If you don't use stat print, you better have a calculator that handles stat. That's a stat function, or you can use, you can use uh, Excel, as long as it has a stat function. This already will take the data and feed it into here so that you can run a test. That makes it kind of easy. And, and then this particular, if you hit it here, then it ends up opening the textbook for the one that you're having a problem with. So right now I'm opening up the textbook. Yeah. And it says section one one was due last week. Is yeah, but it's, that's not. Don't worry about it right now because I apparently I had the wrong condos course. <laughs> oh, okay. So we can, turn, we can turn our section one one on Monday. Yeah. Okay. So wait, the work I did last week on my Pearson wasn't the right word. I don't know. What work did you turn? You did it with me here in the classroom. Did you have my setup? Yeah. Okay. Then. Yeah. It was the right one. Okay. Yeah, if you use that out, it's okay. Anyway, here it opens up to what that helps you answer the question. And if you get stuck, you start saying, Do you need to see a problem that's not like it? And you go, yeah. And then it kind of pretty well steps you through. You can also contact me. Now, in the book itself, is pretty cool because let's see if I got some of this stuff here. Let me show you what happens. In the book itself, oftentimes it has. Um, you know, the equation, but it has, uh, this is an example about baby weights and distribution of baby weights. Mm. I like it, well, I enjoy this because it's got a lot of help. Mm. Okay, I don't want to show it now, I can't find it. Um, okay. So, oh, and then before you do the homework, like, like my exercises would be right here. I don't know if you can see them. If this problem has 10 homework assignments. I mean, just 10 homework, 10 questions. But beyond it, right above it, if, if you, you scroll through these, it gives you kind of a hint of what to, how to help solve it if you don't. So does that mean if you need it? So you have to do them in order to answer the questions. You have to go through those. Yeah, you have to go through it, but if you don't want to finish, just get out and go yeah. to the next. So this would be an example of uh, working it through. Uh, there's a, it's actually a movie. There's a lot of technology, especially help for uh, some problem. I don't have the other one, so you get the idea. Um, so all of these would be, you know, video clips, confidence intervals using Excel. If you're going to use Excel. If you're going to use stack crunch, if you're going to use a calculator, it gives you an idea how to do it. Okay, so uh, here's if you're using a TI, you know, 83 or 84, shows you how to use it. Okay, if you have a question that actually has, I can't, they're not letting me open it. That actually has data, you're going to click it, and it's going to take you to this thing here called stack crunch. TechCrunch is a software program to do statistical analysis. You'll see it right here at the bottom. See the TechCrunch? So this is now, it should open up TechCrunch. Okay. <coughs> the data is going to be loaded in from your textbook. Um, so if not, you can go just visit the site. This is what it looks like. Um, my name is my data or data sets that are already in. The data set, those homework problems that you're doing, you can do it online. It's right here, all the data sets are here, so you don't have to enter them. If you want to do it by hand, uh, see that this is something like Excel. And then these are the things that are going to solve, you know, different tests you have for statistics, the different graphs you have. That will help you do it. Is that clear? All right. All right, so I'll leave it up to you to decide which one you want. My, I think the world is easier to do this because it's the latest thing. Not just because it's the latest. You have the online book, you have the help, you have, you can get stuck. 
on that problem and ask you if you want to see one similar. It doesn't get much better. Okay. So let's go back. Uh, okay, this is the book. And this is the PowerPoint thing for the other book. The book you're, I think, all right. Is any of you using, you're using my math up, right? Just one person? Okay, all right. Let's try it. All right, now, number one, chapter one, is this, this concept of descriptive versus statistics, inferential. What does inferential mean? What is it? I mean, the vocabulary, what's inferential or inference? Yeah, you're making an inferential, you're making an inference from something that this descriptive is a statistic for which we will take, we will use it to make inferential uh, projections. So, what I was trying to say is that if, if, if you recall, if I can. Okay, if you recall, when I drew before, remember I had this space that was called a population pit space? You can recall? That's too big to graph. The question is too big. What, you know, what percentage of Americans, let's say, have AIDS? Well, you can't really go through the whole country. But you might take a subset. So that subset is called a sample. This I can put my hands on. This is called, in here, these guys are called descriptive statistics. And then, statistics. Okay, these in here, oh, hi, here you are. Where, where's the other two? The little one. Oh, <laughs> I got some more. Yeah, right. And then, Okay, and here, okay, these have things that we'd like to know about, we'd like to know about in the population, but it's just too big, so we're going to take a subset, and that subset has to be taken randomly as possible, and so I'm saying that this guy, then, these, these, these things are called statistics. This is called an average or a mean. That's what x bar means. It equals equal average. Is the same numeric algebra average that you're equal to, or another word for it is called a mean. M-E-A-N, right? The only thing that you have to do that anything in this side, you need to precede it with the word sample. This is a sample. <laughs> I was curious if that was going to happen. <laughs> Would I have to move it a little bit? Oh, no. It makes me read. Look, read. Sign in. God damn. This is not, this is ridiculous. All right, you want to, where's my assistant, trusty assistant? Yeah, maybe you could move the mouse every now and then. No? Because it's shutting off on me. Okay, actually, let's try a different. So what I'm saying is that this guy is the average, true? Okay, that, that, um, okay. So it's a sample, sample average. This guy, S, is a sample deviation. Okay? And then we have some guy that's called P, and it has a hat on it. So that P hat is going to be called sample proportion. Okay? All of these things are called descriptive statistics, these guys. Right? And, and there's one more thing. Now that we're going to learn how to organize the data, we're going to have histogram. Or we have frequency graph first, and then we develop into a histogram. We're going to use these as inferential statistics to make predictions on the things we'd like to know about the big picture. It is not possible for us to figure out what is the true average of the population. Instead, we take a subset, randomly selected subset, and now we want to make predictions about the parameters, mu. Mu is a Greek letter, and it means, notice it's preceded by the word population, which I'm just putting pop. 
So this is population average or mean. Something analogous to this guy, see? And the reason it's called inferential description is we're going to use this, this is the most important part of all, to find out the average of the population by using the average from the sample. Do you recall that? Yeah. Okay. This is a sample deviation that we're going to use to inferentially predict sigma, lowercase sigma, which is population deviation. It's no more complicated than that, except for the fact that we have to get to this idea that the big picture is going to be predicted from the little picture. <coughs> okay? And p hat is a proportion. For example, what proportion of Americans have AIDS? That's not an average. I'm asking, I believe, the proportion, let's say, is 3%. That's not an average. That's a proportion. And then there's a true proportion. We call it P, which is going to be population what? Follow the pattern. Population what it be? This is called sample proportion. Yeah, this one's population proportion. You see? And guess what's going to be the inferential statistic? This. And our histogram finally is going to be an inferential statistic that something's very important is to the way the true population distribution of data really is. This is giving it this outer shape will give us an idea of what the true distribution is coming from. That means that the data is lining up, tying up in this way over and over again. That's some structure that we can manipulate to use to make some predictions later. We're trying to find out signal and all the noise. Yeah. So why is that one descriptive statistics at the bottom of the sample instead of the population? Is it because all of these are descriptive statistics? Yeah, but wouldn't the other side of the population be too, or is it not? On the population side, these guys are called parameters. Okay. And guess what? They're population parameters. This is terminology you have to get used to, but really. I'm going to use these little morsels from my sample to make the big answer the big questions with a certain probability. That's bold. I'm going to take this guy here and put boundaries around what only the gods know with a certain probability. That's statistics. Okay? So, inferential, descriptive, and inferential. These describe, and these will be what we're throwing the inferences on. All right? And now it looks weird. But I hope that average is not too weird a concept for you. Right? It's the average. It's the total number of observations that added together their values divided by the total sample size. And that brings us to this. The number of observations in the population that we call capital N. You see the capital? But when we take a subset, we call this little n. So this is our sample size. And this is our population size. Let me clear that up a little bit. Let's go make it. Yeah. So I'm going to clear it up. Okay. So what I'm saying is, in this huge ocean of population, now the word population is unfortunate because it doesn't have to be about people, it can be anything. But usually it's so massive of a size that I call this my population. And we call it, in mathematics, we call it population space. Okay. And it's made up of bunches and bunches of data, well, which I can label the first one, let's say, x to 1. It's just the name I give it. That's a subscript. And the next observation, I'll go x of 2. And I'll go this on and on until I continue that, until I finally hit that. So what, what's my last one? x of what? Which end? Which end? There are two ends. No, nope. when the population you have capital M. Big N. Yes. Yeah. The sample is little is a subset of the big N. That's wild. I've never had that. Never had that happen to me. Well, except the last class. <laughs> it's nice to. I have to register in the dark here. Okay, do I get it right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just throw something out here.
remember that the sample size was capital N. Do you remember? Does anybody remember that? I know it was like a minute ago. And so what does that make this one? The very last observation. This could go out for millions. We don't know. I just say mathematics could express that thing that it finally ends somewhere on the nth thing. Whereas over here, we're going to take a subset and we're going to pick some of these. You see, I'm going to pick some, but I'm not looking. I'm not looking as I'm drawing. I'm making it unbiased. I'm making an unbiased selection. And whatever I pick in here, I'm going to rename them X1, X2. So this is going to go X1. That's my first observation I pulled out of the population. This is the second, right? And dot, dot, dot. Now, what's my last one there? One. Little n. Because little n is the sample size for the sample space. If you have these as numerical values, certainly you can calculate an average. Add them all up and divide by capital N. Yes? But it's too big for us. So we're going to use this guy, which is called X bar. It is the average of our sample observations, or another word for it is called the word mean. Mean and average are the same thing. But we know that in the population there must exist a true population of which we'll not know. So I say, for uh, pedagogical reasons, that mu is known by the gods only. This is not a religious thing. Okay, I'm just putting it as a, there must be this ultimate truth kind of thing. We don't know what it is. Uh, I'm saying, if I was looking for, okay, so let's say I want to know what the average IQ is in the country. So I have to go to every person give my IQ test, and before I finish, some people are dying, and some people are born, and I just, just can't get him on it. So instead, I make a random selection of people and ask them to take this test, and then I'm going to use this, which is my sample. Remember, anytime I'm asking you for something here, precede it with the word sample, sample average, sample mean. Whereas this one, it's the same idea, except just preceded by population average which we'll never get a handle on. And population, another word for it is called mean. M-A-N-E. Okay? So as I just drew before, and I'll even make it a color, that we'll be using this descriptive statistics to make inferential on what we'll never be able to handle. This we can get an idea. Okay? And it turns out that we have a Greek letter, again, it's called sigma, but lowercase, this is uppercase sigma, when you draw in the fraternity surrender, you'll, you'll learn all this. And, and this is called my population deviation. Okay, what is deviation? Deviation is the way that the data is being dispersed about the average. Did you hear that? Yeah? yeah. It looks like it's on No, not you. No. Okay, data the and way, here. Wait, data is the way what is being dispersed? What did you just say? Uh, that sentence? Data is always something to disperse. Disperse. So what, Spread. I'll show you. No, what was the sentence you said? That deviation uh -huh. is referring to the way the data is okay. spread about the average, me and you. Okay. And guess what? What what symbol am I going to use to make inferences from? I mean, what, what's the descriptive statistic will make inference of that? That one's called S. S is our sample distribution. See it? And that, and that, what we use to predict that, which we can't get our hands on too big. Okay? When I'm, I'm at the, notice, when I talk about this, this, I make it kind of a funky P, but it's still a P. Is that there's a lot of different pieces. I'm making this a little different. And I'm going to call this the true population proportion. Okay? When I ask the question, how many people in the United States currently have AIDS? That's a percentage. It's not an average. I'm not asking, if this, I'm not asking what the average, whatever. I'm asking in this case, what percentage? which is a proportion of the whole. Okay? 
So I have my descriptive statistic over here is going to be p hat. p hat is a statistic that you don't know what it is, but we'll be using this as a ratio to help predict what the true proportion is. If we're not asking a question about mu, yeah, if we're not asking a question about deviation, we may be asking a question about proportion. Now, the last thing is that in chapter one, you begin to look how to organize data. So you have these cells, these class widths that you develop from the raw data, and you start doing a tally of how many are fall in each of these particular class widths. <coughs> okay, and I'm going to say like this. This is a frequency tally. You can put it a vertical axis and have one, two, three, four, five, right? I was keeping track of it, but I didn't want to do it while you were writing. Let me on. Let me see that. Okay, you see this? This is capital. These are not capital. That's it. Don't say it out loud. <laughs> <coughs> same heights, the number, this height would say is 2 because it represents 2 frequencies. This is 3 because it represents 3 and 5 and so on. If we take these, this, this 2 and we divide by little n, we take the 3 and divide by little n, we take these and then take this by n. Remember, n is the sample size. Then what we have now are probabilities. So the probability of falling into here will be 4 divided by n. And you structured this so that every observation is going to fall in somewhere. And what I'm interested in more than anything else is really the shape of it. Because this is going to give me some idea, you'll see as it comes later on, of what the true population, we call this the population distribution of the data. This is distribution, not deviation. Okay? This, this thing that you're doing in chapter 1 and 2 of writing up and categorizing data is meaningful because what we're saying is this phenomenon that's occurring, whatever the rate of people who have AIDS, seems to be piling up with most of the people like between, in this age group, let's say, that's the majority, and the real old or real young, they have less probability of being sick, or less because most die out or whatever. All right, now, I'm going to start telling you more and more about these. What I, what I want to do is, is I want you to read the book, whichever one you want, and I want you to start learning how to just organize the data. That's something you have to do. I, I can show you one or two, but I'm more interested in showing you why we're going to be doing it. This is what you won't get in most classes, because it's a hard course to teach. This is my master's degree in statistics. So, okay. And are there any questions about this? So far, I mean, I know it looks a little weird because you don't know what any of these mean yet, but I'm about to tell you. I just want you to know that these are the things we seek to make a probability guess about using these descriptive statistics, that's all. And I'm sure you can understand that, you know, I'm using a subset here to make inferences about it. It's not that, it's not that complicated, I don't think. I think you have a master's degree, so it's not going to be that complicated to you. <laughs> is, it, is it complicated to you? No, this part isn't, but I'm just saying, in general, like, it's not going to be that complicated to you. Well, I can tell you it's easier after you know it. Well, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you know it. Yeah, but I, you think I need struggle or what? But I was well, you, you, you speak <laughs> like it came naturally. I'm just saying. <laughs> the life is, uh, not so easy. But, um, Okay. Now let me try to fill in more about what these are. Okay, now let me give you an example of what X bar is, what S is, and we'll do a history. Okay, all right, so let's just, uh, let me clear this out. So, don't freak out, I think I already did this last time. But this is the symbol for sigma, sigma chi alpha and all those different, that's capital sigma. 
But in mathematics, we mean summation. All right? We mean add, add, add. That's, this is a compact way of saying thing. And it's a program, and I want you to learn the program. I say it's an algorithm to help us solve problems. And it turns out it defines the definition of an average. What is this? A sample average, or we can call it the mean. Okay? And it's called x bar in the symbol. And what you do, remember my observations? They went from x1, comma, x2, comma, dot, dot, to x of little n. You recall that? So I'm going to have my counter start at i equals 1, and I'm going to have it pinch an n. And I have i here. And I'm going to divide this by little n. What is little n? The sample size. Of, of what? Of the sample. <laughs> Okay? And that's how you calculate an average. This, uh, it, don't matter for just that's how we do it mathematically. Now, let me show you how we expand, because we like, as mathematicians, use a compact way. Right? So what I'm going to do is, this is how you do it. You take the number one, which is a pointer, like in the software program, like in the program, and the one goes into this little i. So I write it down. X, and I plug in that one. You see it? And then I ask myself, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I ask myself, I'm at one, right? I ask myself, it's an if. Does one equal n? No, probably not, because I need to be a sample size of one. Okay, I'm just saying, let's we'll say in this case, there are several observations and x, okay? If the answer is no, that one doesn't equal n, the whole purpose in life of sigma is to generate a plus sign. That's it. Okay? And then this counter moves to 2, because we use up 1. You'll see this in math a lot. If any of you go on, we have to calculus everywhere a lot. So we take this top index and move to 2. So now I put 2 in there, and I put x of 2. And I ask exactly the same question, does 2 equal n? If it's no, boom, pushes out another one of these. That's called a boom push. Okay? And it says, okay. And I continue that, continue that, and this, this dot, dot, dot means continue until this counter moves to n, such that n equals n, right? Then I know to stop putting plus signs. And I have to continue with this. Why, you should recognize this as a simple average. I went through all of that for a simple average. All right? Now, let's draw from a pool of data. Let's draw a really simple, unbiased sample. And let's say that I'm going to call this, uh, let's say, 80, and the next one's 90, and the next one's 100. Let's keep it easy. And, boom. Can you do like 30, 40, 50? Because we've done 80, 90, 100. You don't like my numbers? OK, 30. Well, this means you're flunking the test, then. 30, 40, 50? I'm just kidding. OK, now. <laughs> I'm going to label this guy x of 1. That's my first observation that I put from the, from the population. x of 2 and x of 3. All right? So I simply plug in chart. What is n here, by the way? If that's my sample, what is, how many observations do we have? That's correct. The sample size is 3. So this guy is going to go summation from 1. Guess what n is going to be? Three, yeah? yeah. So the end result is going to be x one plus x two plus x three, right? But we know n is three, and I've labeled what these are. By the way, can you look at these three numbers? Tell me what the average is. Ten. Average is not ten. There's not even ten there. It can't be less than thirty. It can't be more than fifty. Forty. Forty. Average is in the middle. Average is an average. Which one would say ten? That would be deviation. That's, That's, what That's what you meant? That's well, then not what you meant. You're correct, but I'm missing you're wrong. Okay, so now. I think that's what I meant. So what do I do? I got x1, and what is it? And what is x2? And what is this? And divide by 3. So that's what that meant. How would it have looked here? I would have simply had summation of i starting from 1, right, to x of i. 
ending at 3 divided by 3. This would be my x bar. Thank you. You're the first live mouse I've had. Okay. I get paid for it. Oh, this here? No. You no. talking about capital sigma? This? No. Down. Three? No. Up. Yeah. I? I. That's the letter I. I. I is an index telling you where to start counting from. There's the one. I. I is an index counter. Notice there's an I, little I here by the X. Mm -hmm. See, that one has an I. Waiting for you to put in which one you want. That X1. Like oh, I see. Well, I. I did fail penmanship as a young man. I think it's genetic, I just can't write. Um, okay, well what is this then? What's 30? Well here's 90. Would you agree that's 120? Divided by 3, correct? Exactly what was predicted. That's why I kept it simple. Okay. You, you, what do you want? Well, I mean, just not ones that are like 10 apart. Like, can we do like a more complicated one? Oh, yeah, but first let's do the simple one. I'm trying to keep it simple. And then look, you want ones that aren't, aren't smoothly. Yes. It's still the same thing. It's still the same process. But let's I'm doing this only so you can see what the answer should be. Mostly, always on the array of dots, you'll not know unless you do the calculations. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I should put the calculations. Oh, yeah. But let me let me just finish this. Remember what I said what the district what the deviation is? It's the spread away from the average. This 40 is the x bar. You see the way the other two scores have dispersed out? By units of what? 10. Ah, if you saying 10, you'll be right. This is 10. So my prediction is that what we're saying just by looking at it, because we're not doing some heavy calculation here, is that S should be 10. We'll, we'll do some extra. Yeah, this is going to be deviation, which is and preceded by the word sample. Because these are descriptive statistics that we're making predictions on. Okay? Somebody say okay. Okay. All right. So now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave some of this stuff. And now I'm going to give you the equation for deviation. Okay, and we'll use the same data set, not this one. Okay, I'm like that. And then we'll go here. Try to clean it up properly. Okay, so this is the equation that we need for deviation. Sample deviation. The sample is S. And again, it's equal to the summation. Just like the other one, I equals, this is an I. about the space between how they disperse away from the, oh, this is x bar, how they disperse away, right? So look what I'm going to do. I'm going to take in parentheses every observation, just like, remember the x bar? Yeah, that's so bad. That's going to be the worst. You should complain about your laptop. It's not that. It's For every observation, we're going to subtract to see how far away it is from its average. Right? Because it's a spread away. And the average can't be any smaller than 30 or any bigger than 50. Right? The average is somewhere in the middle. Yes? So there's sometimes that the average will be bigger than this observation, but not as big as that. So the point is that this can be negative. And so to prevent that, we square it. That means two copies of it. Cha chain, cha chain, remember? Okay, and we divide this whole thing by not n, but n minus 1. And of this, we take the square root. And that's how you do it. That's the sample deviation. Not nice. Okay, so 
Let's let's try it up. Let's try it out. Don't forget to put your little house because everything is under this house. See it? And now I'm going to expand this. What am I going to do? I'm going to take that one and where am I going to stick it? Into that eye. Sticking a one into the eye. So, right? The same process. So now here I'm going to put the parentheses. I'm going to put x of one. And I'm going to subtract our x bar that we calculated earlier. And I'm going to square it. We jump back to this and we ask, is 1 equal n? No, let's say. Then this thing, this summation, produces a plus sign. And the index moves to 2. So I have x of 2 minus the mean again, squared. And I'm going to go plus dot 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 plus till I get to xn minus x bar x little n squared. And then I'm going to put n minus 1. Okay, and now we're going to do the example. The, one, the number she doesn't like, they're too nice. But I would like to see that it does work and that, that we better come up with s equals n. So, really, I'm just saying, okay, well, let's do this. And what I'm doing now is simply now, what is my sample size? Three. Three, correct. There are three observations. So now my summation is going to be from i equals, this is i, equals 1 to 3. And here I have my x of i, so let's subtract x bar, this is an i, and square it. I'm just copying the same thing, you don't think I changed n to 3. Right? But this is n minus 1, and you know that n is 3. So, guess what n minus 1 is? Good. This is a measure of dispersion from, from the mean. So, let's expand that. All right? So, don't forget your house. And then, both stories, both floors of the house are in here. So, I put the 1 in here. And I get that. Yes? X1, yes? But what is X1? 30. Good. 30. And what was the average? 40, wasn't it? Squared. Plus? What was x2? That's right. Minus? What's the mean? The average. There you go. Squared plus? What's next? 50 minus 40. Okay. And this is going to be 50 minus 40. Correct? Squared. All over what? 2. That's right. So, let's go down a little further. Do you see that this is minus 10? Yeah. But this is squared means two copies of minus 10. That means minus 10 times minus 10. It doesn't mean two times minus 10. It means whatever that number is, multiply it again. So what is minus 10 times minus 10? That's right. Is it positive? It is positive, right? Because it's a negative and a negative. Now, what is 40 minus 40? 30 is 0, right? And 0 squared is still 0. So I'll just forget that one. Now, well, this is 10, but positive. Right? And that squared, that's another 100. Right? And that's divided by 2. And that's supposed to be the square root of 200 divided by 2, which is the square root of what? Right? Now, what number times itself? This is the opposite of a square. This is not multiplying two numbers. This is what number times itself would be equal to 100. And there it is. So that's 10 apart. Are we okay with that? No? Okay. Which part? Which part aren't you okay with? I guess I need to do about 100 of these before I can. Well, here's 100. Well, here's 100. That makes 200. Do you understand that these are what my, my, my observations, right? I, there's this big pool of data that, you know, it's two giants, so we close our eyes and we pick these three points. Why are all the X's in that? Well, there's only one X. The only thing is, i got to give it a name, 30, I have to give it a positional name. So I decided to call it, you can call me Bob or Bill, or you can call me X1. But X1 equals 30 in my case. 
And you can call me Bob or Bill or Jack or whatever, but X2, I just hung it before you. <coughs> there has to be some way that you take your data and organize it and then use observation. And that's all it is. This is my first observation. You have to be used to it. Because I told it, it was the 30th, we've got to use it. We already calculated our average. Our average, remember, was the sum of all your points. It's simply equal to 30 plus 40. Two plus 40. Can you see it? Plus 50. Okay. My battery. Mm -hmm. Oh, there. The mic came on. No, I don't. Okay. 40 plus, well, 30 plus 40. Plus 50. This is how you calculate an average. That's all it is. I just made it a little more, I mean, this looks more complicated. But it's no, the average is no more than that of all of your observations and divide by the number of observations, which is little n. Okay? And this is very much like an average, except for every data point you're subtracting the average. Alright? So, let me do it in a table format so it might look easier. Okay, so I'm going to do these two things, but in table format. All right, let me clear this. All right, so table format would be that this is my data in general. All right, so my data here in general, this is an I. I'm going to have, in our case, it was what, 30? 40 and 50, that's the observation, right? To find x bar, all you have to do is add those up. 30 plus 40 plus 50, right? 120, right? Mm -hmm. And divide by the sample size, n equals 3. This is a little n. That's it, we're done with the average, which was equal to 40, yes? Mm -hmm. Now, in order to find my deviation, I'm just going to take the next step up, which is xi minus x bar. That's how easy it's going to be to do the deviation. It's every observation minus this guy. So this is going to be 30 minus 40. The next guy is going to be what? 40 minus 40. That's right. And the next guy? 50 minus 40. That's right. Now, if you look at the general equation for the deviation, it was the square root of, remember we had x1 minus x bar squared plus x2 minus x bar squared, yes, plus dot, 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 plus my last, right, minus x bar squared, yes, all over n minus 1, right? So right now, I'm calculating this guy. You see it? So all I have to do in this column is go xi minus x bar squared. Well, if, if n is 3, then that will be 2. If n, n the number n is n, since there are 3 of them, right? But I have, this is a general equation. I'm not plugging in 3 in there now. So I'm just showing you that I'm following this format. See, this is calculating these guys. And this is squaring these guys. So this is minus 10 squared. This is 0 squared. This is 10 squared. You see it? We're already doing almost most of the calculation. And what are you going to do? You're going to sum them up. Just like I summed them here. This is 120. But you can see that minus 10 squared is 100, right? Yes? yes. And this one? 10 squared? 100. So this, if you add them up, it's 200. Right? So the only thing we have to do now, now we've got this whole thing done. The top thing is, now if I put in the actual problem, this minus 6 squared, this minus this squared, all added together is 200. And I have to divide by what is 3 minus 1. There it is which gets us back to the square root of 100.
But you have to know that only number multiplied itself to get that. How's your square roots? Well, I was asking about square roots in particular. No? no? Um, okay. Well, anyway, you do know 200 divided by 200, right? Yeah. So you'll, you'll have to know that. Also, you'll have to know that when I tell you that 10, this 2 means, make, that means, and it's up high, when it's in the power, it means two copies of it. I go 10, to chain 10. To chain is a copy machine. It makes two copies. But it means multiply. And the reverse is the square root of 100. Square root of 100, you know, we know that, that it's looking for, you know, can write 100 to 10 times 10. But if you don't see it, there's a 2 and a crack in there. And that means look for groups of 2 that comes out. When they come out, they become just one unit. But uh, we might have to practice a little square root. But, uh, all right, so, okay. So what am I going to do in the bigger scheme of things? Remember, in my sample space, I have an x bar, right? And I'm going to use that to make the big space, which we never know is mu. This is going to be my best guess, my best inference, right? What is it? In our case, it's 40, right? Here it is, 30, 40, 50. And s that we calculate will be my best guess for the true deviation. Call that lowercase sigma. What is this? Population average. What is this? Populate. I'm sorry. This is sample average. Population average. Sample deviation. Population deviation. P hat. You can't really see it. P hat is going to be a proportion. And this is the true proportion. And uh, we'll get to that later. This is S, by the way. Right? And I'm using this one to predict about this. And finally, I'm going to organize the data to get an idea of my density, called probability density, or distribution. This is the way the data is distributed. And there's actually a true distribution under here. Notice it's a lot smoother. This is like steps. Why? Because we have a lot more data than we do over here. So in theory, we expect this to be some oftentimes very smooth. Not always, but. Okay, now I'll give you an example of how to get average. That's, that's the hard part. <coughs> okay. Now, um, you can practice these. Whatever data you can see, if you have to do it by hand, <coughs> if you have a calculator that doesn't have this equation readily to be done, you have a calculator, all you have to do is enter, enter these guys. Just enter them. And hit boom. And then come out. Both the average will come out and that will come out. I don't know what you're using as a calculator, but if you're using the software, very easy. Suppose that this is 20 of them. And you're using your book. And you want to go to some program or calculator, then in your calculator you have to enter all 20 data points. Then you have to look how to say, okay, find me the sample average. And find me sample deviation as well, if you know how to use it. <laughs> okay? In math stat lab, my, my stat lab, when you go to a homework problem, it takes a 10 and automatic, all oh, the whole set of data, all 20 and automatic, I'm off, I'm going to put them into the, which you have, right? You have, you have my stat lab, right? Yeah, but I don't have a calculation. Well, the other program will do it. It's part of an integrated with my math lab. It's called my stat crunch. There's no stat crunch. Okay, I don't have to get that. Yeah, yeah. So you, if any of you, you say you'll see this for a week. Okay, any question? Then let's go back. <coughs> Oh, she's reacting. Huh? Seven. There's like 30 more minutes. I know it's exciting. It's going by quick. Oh, this then 645. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's take a look at what we have. This, 
This thing here is, you know, of course, computers and calculators, if you want. In the book, it tells you how to use it for the calculator, how to use it for Excel, how to use it in stack crunch, whatever way you have to do it, do it. Okay? And then we talk about collecting data. How should we do it unbiasedly? Unbiased as possible. Right? We, we want, wait, look. I, I always use a blueberry pie. Big one. And I don't know, sitting on a picnic table, right? You smell, you smell it. Damn, that smells good. Guess what? You just received some data. Guess what? You just made a statistical prediction. I bet that pie's good. Why? Because I've analyzed some data that's coming in there, right? But I'm not too sure. So, in order to make a, a, a claim, the claim is this blueberry pie is very good, right? What I'll do is take a sample and stick my finger in there. But I'm good without looking. I don't want to put any bias into the way I'm selecting it. So I put it in, I try it out. Mm. I just had another data point in. It's kind of interesting. You see, ten, the evidence tends to confirm my, you know, tending to confirm my uh, original prediction about that good pie. But I take another one, sample, a little more samples of other. Obviously, you eat the whole pie, you know, for sure. This is a damn big pie. So you do it again and again, but I'm not looking, right? Because if you concentrate, if you concentrate your selection in one spot, the rest of the pie can be burnt. You understand? You can lie with statistics by biasing the way you're selecting the data from the from the whole big picture, right? So my first data that when I stuck my finger in there, I'm calling it x of one. I got to call it something and give it a number from one to ten. Okay. So when I stuck my finger in once, I caught, stuck it in twice. Okay, so guess what? The next time I put my thumb into it, with the second try, down to my last try, which is the end of the land. Right? So yeah. 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 So, in this case, my sample size, how many did I pick? I picked the end of them. See? A little end. Or in our case, it would stop at x, comma, 3. Not x, the three, right? So in this case, my, this is the whole total number of observations that I pulled out of the big picture. What's the big picture called? Population. Population. And what's the subset of the population? Sample size. Sample size. Good. Okay. So these are data collection techniques, methods by which you can stick your finger into the pie. And I leave that to your reading. And how to do that unbiasedly. Okay. And uh, we'll have variables and different types of, of data. For example, it could be like in letter form, like. Um, a, B, C, D, like grades. So you'll have to assign some numerical value to it so that we can... These are things that I'm going to go to you. Uh, we'll go through it a little bit here. Okay. Um, all right. So, statistics is a science of conducting. I like to think of statistics as the art of prediction. It's art because it's not, it's not, I mean, when you get a weather forecast, right, it's going to rain with what? A certain probability. They can't ever tell you. This is, we can't tell you this is exactly it. We can only say it looks like this is it, that the evidence is supporting this with a certain degree of probability. That's important. It's better to flip than just a coin, even though that's probably it too. And just make a head and tail, right? This is an organized way uh, but it becomes a science because, I mean, an art form a little bit, because it's what you choose to use in the model. It's really kind of from experience. It's like giving a house a value. You look at what else around the soul. So you collect, you organize, you summarize, boring. But I talk about descriptive. We talk about that and the inferential. Right? We use the descriptives to make inferential predictions about, do you remember the parameters? Mu, sigma, P, you recall that? And the true distribution. Those are calling my parameters. 
The other ones I'm calling on the sample side. Okay. Mm. So here's your quantitative versus qualitative. That's what I was saying. Sometimes you might have letters instead of numbers. So then on this, and then so you're going to have to decide which kind of set it is, and then massage it. This can be ranked. Okay, this is qualitative. It's more like a taste. This is quantitative, right? Now, when they start piling up, remember I said it starts piling up on your histogram. When it starts piling up in your cells, there are two broad ways it can be. It can be distributed. For example. If I wanted to find the distribution of if I want to find a distribution of throwing a dice, if the dice is fair, I would expect that the distribution would be a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six. As you can see, these will have a probability of being of one six, right? If any one of these has a probability of one six, you see. Now notice that there's no measurement between one and two. It's either one or two. It's a gap. You see the gap? But it's uniform because it's all we regret if it's really truly a fair dice. In the long run, we expect that each one of these would have a one six probability coming up. One out of six faces, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Now, this because we gap, there's no such thing as a one and a half thing on the dice. Makes it a discrete. This is a computer science. Ones and zeros. Continuous would be like if I had, you know, talking about a large population and, and I start to take their sizes and do a distribution of their size. You will find that almost everything in biology will fill up in cells like this with a bell curve that we call it normal distribution. For some reason, in nature, and everywhere and that has something to do with like biology, everything's grouped in the middle. With your outlines here, like the, let's say we're doing heights, the shortest people versus the long people, but the majority of people fall in here. Which is, if you're doing, if you're talking about a sample, it would be X bar here. If you want to know how it's spreading out, that's the gear S. You see, this deviation is greater than a distribution that would be like this. Obviously, this S is going to be right with best variance. Okay. Okay. Good on there. I'm going to throw something. Nope. Six, four, eight. Okay? Yeah, so fine. that's all this is saying. So, like, notice that with heights, I can take any height in between. It doesn't matter. There's no gaps, really. That's why it becomes looking so smooth. I can have 2.59 and 3.21. You understand? But with discrete, obviously, it can only come on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and the probability of coming up. People who grouped up in the middle would have the highest probability of somebody landing here. If I were to predict where you land, if I were to grab somebody at random, I would say, well, between here and here, there's probably the most probability that you're going to fall in there. you got to fall in somewhere, right? Because we're making cells for every mine. So if you sum up the probabilities in here, it has to add up to one. Anyway, just let it seep in for now. And uh, let's see, am I got, yeah, okay. For now I want to go uh, here. Okay, uh, so we have, um, more like units, you know, for temperature to look good. I don't know why anybody would use Fahrenheit anymore. <laughs> that was a drunk German who threw a dart somewhere and it hit 32 and go, what? Ah, that's called freezing 32. Well, a moron would do that. No. Are you Fahrenheit? No. And, and, and it, does anybody know what boiling is? Fahrenheit. 212. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, it's 32 really freezing. No, 32 is freezing. Okay. I mean, he decided to call it 32 degrees, which was meaningless to me, freezing. Why wouldn't God's name be picked? Why didn't he pick 35 and 3 quarters? I don't know. Then he threw it again. Ah, we'll call that boiling. 
So he said, okay, I'm going to call 32. So I'm going to call this 32 freezing, and I'm going to call 212. I mean, you had to be on crack. It doesn't mean anything to me to be below to be below freezing. You're not below zero. You're below 32. Whereas centigrade said all scientists and the rest of the world said, hey, how about if we make freezing zero? And how about if we use base 10 and make boiling 100? It makes a lot more sense to me. And that's why the rest of the world, for some reason, Still stuck in some kind of work, and I'm still using you know, inches and stuff below the centimeter. Yeah, that was a little side, a rant. Okay, well, let's go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 These are different types of sampling techniques that I will let you read. Stratified, clustered, so okay. This is reading stuff. I'm trying to get more than you, okay? And then you have design. For example, you got the big picture, right? What is the correct number of samples that you should take out to get a verifiable sample space? If you're going to find the guys who are running for election and you want to make predictions, the person's going to win or not. You're going to sample different voters from different places unbiasedly to see who they're going to vote for. And we're using that subset of people, but how big of a subset should we take to have a reasonable prediction? This is how large should little n be. Remember, n is the number of observations. Well, hopefully. <laughs> but, but if you're talking about, you know, 350 million people of which, let's say, 100 million are eligible to vote, if you only take three observations, it's not, not going to be a very good prediction. If you only ask three people. <laughs> okay, so, and how was it selected? Well, you want to select those people unbiasedly out of the phone book or whatever that still exists. And then, uh, then the sample uh, representation of the population. So, computers and calculators, if you want to know how to solve statistics using the calculator. We use over in the prison, when I teach there, we use these, because they don't off that computer. Um, you can use Excel, Megastat, or Minicab. Or stack crunch. Okay. How are we doing on time? Oh man. Oh, five seconds. seconds. Well, that five seconds. Five seconds. Oh, that's more than enough. Right. One minute. We got a minute. Well, according to the clock on your computer. Okay. Oh, Not anymore. It says forty-five. All right. I guess I just. That's pretty good. Just, just uh, as a. Don't worry. Don't freak out. We have lab. So we want to stay. Just as an aside, if you guys get free Microsoft we're Office week. And by being a student, if you guys were going to use Excel, yeah. you get it for free. Just go on Microsoft's website and put in your student email, and you get a free copy. So if you're doing the paper homework and you need Excel, okay. So I'll be doing those who are not fully aware. It might already be on that computer. Because that's the school issue, right? So what are you trying to download? It may not be on the But if you've got stack, uh, yeah. stack, yeah. it's yeah, just I don't results. know how to get stack. Oh, oh go to your page. Let's see your page. And then you have My Math Lab registration. Did you do that one? Yeah. Okay, so um, My Math Lab Mastering. No, it won't go in Mastering. Let's just see what it does. Oh, it's so look here, so that pop-up blocker, click on it, and then always allow pop-ups from that one. That should be, that should already be a thing because it's a school-issued computer, it should already have the school website allowed, but Are you just kidding? in case, just in case. Oh. <laughs> Um, so we should be able to open this. Yeah. Is it just me? So two of you are both. I think you. I think the two of you are the only two that are using the stat from the my Mind Map. So the stats know. is really cool. It's really simple and you don't. So if you want to help each other out, because you both have it. I don't have my laptop today, but I'll start bringing it every class so that we can use it after. That's good. Actually, after lab, you can work together. Yeah. Yeah. After lab. That'll help you solve the problem. So when you 
I've been up since 4 o'clock this morning and I've been distracted back. I'm so tired. So when I was like, your homework? 4 o'clock. I should get to read that. I should try to stack crunch. I know. It'll come back later. Take somebody up. There'll be a link. So what stack crunch is this? airport? They'll take the computer for this. No, they were at a program there. It's built in college. Oh, prison? No. He's just getting in that So we're just like, you know. I literally, like, and it started snowing on my way there. Why is it you do this on my class is what I don't get. Everything you do I is always on my class. I was supposed to go on Friday. Okay, so let's see. Where is but so I got a call last night saying so I go today. So Does that work? Huh? Is that a job? Me? No. I would become a friend. But... Yeah. So I and then I get back in my tire on my car. Like, so you know, I just bought my car like a month and a half ago, two so months. The tire is literally like about to like start unraveling. Like, what's it called when that happens? It's called unraveling. No, but there's a bigger word for it. A bigger word? Yeah, but like you feel it, you feel it, and it's like starting to bubble, and like I didn't notice it, and like so my two on my front are super, have super tread. My other one on my back has like you know half of the tread the front, and this one is just like shot, like and so I can't even blow out. Well, why would you put one bad tire on your car? The dealership is Oh. I bought it that way. Right. I bought it. Use the card dealerships. So let's just see what the problem says. So I'm going to have to go back. So we're going to use that. Back. Yeah. Uh, begin with the lower limit. Of so are you telling me this because you wanted to leave or what? No, I'm telling you this because I'm telling you. I'm saying what are we doing? 0 0.01. So you want to know what we're doing next? Is that it? Oh. Yeah. We could do a problem. Uh, problem or problem? And then what's the task? Oh, you don't have your team. I do it online. So, how about this? I get to go home today with credit. So, and the next week I'll start bringing my laptop every class so we can do the math class and stuff together. Yeah, I sound good. Best of your credit today. So, what we're doing is we're creating a frequency distribution tank. If they ever, you know, take a poll and who should be like so the teacher of the week is, yeah. or the teacher of the year? You I'm that. putting years in like six times. All right. <laughs> so we're saying is we want right, to create. We want to create. Um, areas, right? We want to create uh, a frequency distribution. Let's call them bays, right? You know, so we're going to create a bay for each data point. But we got to define what the bays are, or like you know stalls or whatever. So uh, if we're going to Let's say we're going to uh, sort horses by height, right? And we're going to say the first stall is horses that are between whatever. You guys use, still use hands, right? So, like, I don't know what that horse cow call horses, right? But let's say we have three stalls. Uh, let's say 14, 14 hands. Right? So, let's, we're going to start with 13, 14, and 15. But this is going to be 15 to 16. We have to define where the start and the end is. And this one's going to be 14 to 14.9. And this one's going to be 13 to 13.99, right? Because I can't overlap the stalls. So now what it's saying is, what this problem is asking you to do is create this, this these So what it's saying is, begin with the lower class limit of 